Hey everybody, Adam Savage, welcome to my cave and this is this is a show and tell you've been asking for. I don't know why I always think that I need to like narratively creep up on the point of the video because I know that it's in the title that you clicked on to watch this video. So we know that we're going to be, um, we know that we're going to be, <laughs> uh, this is a show and tell about my favorite tool in the shop, the milling machine, this one. Sharp-eyed viewers have been noticing for a few months that there is a new sheriff in town, and it is this, this lovely thing. Um, the lighting is weird. Uh, all right, let's try this. Uh, well, maybe I do it with that in the background. Hold on. So, That's my mailing machine. I've been, <clears throat> this old Tony had a great phrase for what I've been doing in COVID. He called it chasing zeros. Uh, in Europe, I guess you would say chasing microns. Um, I've been using a milling machine and a lathe, which is on the other side of my shop. I've been using a milling machine and a lathe since 1991. It's the first time I used both of those tools. and. In that intervening 30 years, I have become a competent operator of these two machines. That's the highest compliment I'll allow myself about my skills on these. I am competent on them. Um, I'm not super fast, but the, the, the longer I go using them, the better the stuff that I turn out with them looks. Um, the, the, the Hellboy Samaritan was a... a a transformative project in the last year. And the milling machine that I built that gun on uh, was a Bridgeport, and it was from 1968. It's one year younger than I am. In fact, actually, I believe that the body of that mill, if I look, I looked up the serial number, the body of the mill came from 68, and the head, the dynamic, the, the variable speed head uh, is from 69. So they're just slightly mismatched, but you know, this is the thing with milling machines. And I got to the end of 2020 and <clears throat> I was thinking about, okay, well, wait a second. So, um, okay, so a milling machine looks to a lot of people like a drill press because you can pull down on an arm and a spindle moves down, this spins and you can drill stuff with it just like a drill. Drill press. Sometimes in the middle of the day, the sun coming through my skylight is so hot. Uh, not hot on me, but hot in the lighting here. Anyway. Um, so the things that a, that a, that a, the things that a mill can do that a drill press can't are, it doesn't just drill stuff, you can actually use Bits like this, this is an end mill. And if I chuck this in, what I've got is a pair of sharpened flutes that pull material up and out. And I can, I can both make holes in stuff, but I can also go along stuff and I can shave off tiny amounts, larger amounts, five thousandths to fifty thousandths in a pass. Uh, you can build a car engine on this thing. Okay, you'd still need the lathe for some of those operations. But um, I was using that milling machine, that Bridgeport, that 52-year-old Bridgeport. I was using it, I've been using it for eight years now, seven years, I think. Wait, 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 no, 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 I tell a lie. I got this milling machine after we wrapped Mythbusters. We wrapped Mythbusters at the end of 2015, so I got this in 2016, it's five years old to me, not this. I don't mean to be confusing. I'm trying to figure out how to cover all this, but the bridge fort that I used to build my Samaritan, Hellboy Samaritan prop um, was 50 years old, and I've been using it for five years, and it's a, a good machine, but it was worn out. What does that mean that it was worn out? That's what I'm trying to get to. What does it mean that my, my mill was worn out? Well, when you have a mill and you can chuck work into it, and 
move the table back and forth to precisely cut off, to robustly cut off precise amounts from the material that I'm affecting in here, be it plastic, resin, aluminum, steel, what have you, um, I have three axes I can move this mill on. I can move it in this axis, I can move it in this axis, and I can move it up and down. And what happens over the lifetime of a milling machine is picture that this table is a, it's a five foot long set of dovetails that nest into uh, uh, a home on this main cross feed. And so these dovetails, their relationship is absolutely critical, right? Like no movement at all because I'm gonna be chucking big chunks of metal in here and I'm gonna be peeling away at them with an end mill. And because of that, I need maximal rigidity. That's literally why this thing is 3000 pounds. It's a giant cast iron turret, um, specifically to remove any vibration. So as you're moving the table back and forth over the lifespan of a mill, you're sliding parts. And that orientation is really tight. You want the mill to be tight. You use whey oil to make sure that the surfaces can move over each other but have a minimum of backlash. And what that ends up happening is, is that they, oh, sorry, one last fact. The, uh, those two surfaces, uh, the mating surfaces of the dovetail, those are called the ways, way, W-A-Y-S. And the ways, as you go back and forth, thousands of times, hundreds of thousands of times, you can imagine that most of the work that most mills do is all within about one foot. Like that's the majority of the machining that they do. They're rarely machining stuff that's the length of the milling table, although they could. The practical result of that is that the middle of the ways gets a lot more action than either end of the ways. And over thousands and thousands and thousands of back and forths between these pieces of metal, small amounts can be worn away. We're talking microns, but it doesn't take many microns to start to feel it in the table. And what you'll notice if, I mean, machinists are all nodding as they hear this, you walk up to a mill and you can kind of tell what shape that mill is in just by turning the dial all the way to the end of the table. Um, if it gets really stiff, what that means is that there's more room in the middle than there is out at the ends, right? So there's this depression in the middle made and the depression is it's half a thousandth, 12 microns, 20, 15, I mean, tiny, tiny, tiny amounts of, of extra room being gotten from the frictive forces means that the practical was even just like a 10,000th, you can feel it out at the end because you'll tighten it for the middle and it'll be too tight for either end. And this is what we mean most often when we talk about mills being worn out. Now, that's actually a repairable situation. The way you repair that is you pull apart the machine and you do what's called re-scraping the ways. And this is a precision operation using, um, using certified flat surfaces and a set of inks and dyes to uh, both check flatness and squareness and be able to adjust those things in tiny, tiny increments. It's a beautiful process. It's a very laborious process. I've never done it. Tom Lipton was going to help me do it. He had a, he had a plan to, it, it, we've been talking about this for a while. So I was thinking about going through the process of re-scraping the ways on my milling machine, which is also an expensive process. It can be in the thousands of dollars. And given that that Bridgeport was, was only worth like a couple thousand dollars. Given how worn out it was, it wasn't really, it didn't really make sense for me to expend a lot of money or time. Well, I'd been thinking about expending the money and the time. And then as 2020 drew to a close, I decided to upgrade. I decided I'd been using a milling machine long enough. Damn it. So I bought a new one. I know, I've never even seen a new mill. I didn't, 
I was talking to Fawn Davis about this just after I got it. Fawn was like, I have no idea they made new mills. I just thought there was some warehouse in Milwaukee where everyone went to get them. And that was kind of the way I thought about it too. I mean, every milling machine in this special effects shop is in a special state. And the machinists who are the specialists in those shops are all pissed off about it. I mean, this is just a universal truth. Um, and so Fawn and I, we've used a lot of compromised and worn out milling machines. And we, you know, for film work, it's generally totally fine. But like I said, I've been chasing zeros and I wanted a little more out of my machine. Uh, and so I got this from Sharp in LA. I ordered it in December. It arrived in February. Yeah, I guess so, somewhere around February. Um, and I love it. I'm gonna take you on a little tour through it. But first I would like to take you on a tour through <clears throat> what we went through to get it in here. Because uh, this path I'm walking, the mill, came down this path. Yeah, it, it, it was, um... <sighs> so, uh, I had to open up this loading door, which I literally do maybe once a year, and that requires moving a bunch of stuff away. Then, um, there's, I had to make, <laughs> so you can see my shop there in the distance, I had to make a six foot wide hole all the way through here. In fact, also, there's an artificial floor here. This is concrete, but it slopes. And so we built this flat floor that goes all the way back. So I was able to drive a forklift holding the milling machine into here, but I couldn't get past this point. This isn't rated for a forklift. It's rated for a milling machine, but not a milling machine with a forklift. So I had to drop the milling machine here on these traveler dolly wheels that they specially make that are crazy expensive. I, I've got a guy in San Francisco, he moves mills, that's what he does. He's moved all of my machinery and he has these, these wheels. Uh, so he left them with me. It's just a long story, but like, the guy who was supposed to move the mill had to go do another job, so I ended up doing most of the mill moving. He moved the old one out, which is like, was amazing. But I moved the new one in and I dropped it here and then slowly pushed it, pushed it, Pushed it, getting stuff out of the way, taking stuff down, removing stuff from the ceiling, pulling aside the entire bookshelf here with all of the round materials, moving all of these mobile tool carts. It was dudes, dudes and dudettes. It was a day. But eventually, after about four hours, we got in. A um, couple of things. Uh, Last year, I spent the dough on a Kurt Weiss, and the hype is real. These are just magnificent pieces of equipment. I've always had cheap milling machine vices. I've always had the $150 vice. Um, and it like, it's one of the most common questions I get from new makers, which is what should what tools should I spend money on? And the answer is always the ones that hold value for you, right? Like, so I've always had these cheap vices and they've always held their value for me because I didn't need too much out of them. But again, once I started chasing zeros and I needed real repeatability and no rise and all the things you get out of a high quality piece of equipment, I spent the money on a Kurt Weiss and I am really happy about it. I also bought a setup table. That's what this piece of steel is. Um, it's got uh, threaded holes around it. It just makes setting up flat work a lot easier. And I thought, you know, as long as I'm setting up, I do most of my work on a vice, but I've also been doing more fixture based work. And I thought I wanted a little more versatility and. I'm also protecting the, the chrome tops of the, uh, of the lathe table uh, by putting this down. <sighs> Let's see, what are the main features of my sharp mill? Uh, one feature is that it's got a, oh wait, I can turn this, hold on. One feature is that it's got a beautiful, uh, digital speed control. It's also crazy silent. It's really, really quiet and setting. So, so nice. Um, I, uh, I did the full Cadillac version. So I got the, um, I got the air powered uh, drawbar, which allows me to easily uh, load and unload tooling. Um, the Sharp Mill, Sharp, 
The sharp mill is effectively the same exact form factor as the bridge port, which means that most bridge port parts play nicely with the sharp parts, which is great. I was able to keep my, um, my, my five ball uh, arm here for the quill. I was able to keep my, this is actually one of my favorite pieces. Uh, this is, oh, there we go. This is my quill feed. And I didn't have one of these on the old mill, so I made this one and I made this. Do you remember when I uh, replaced the hand wheels on my table saw? This was the old hand wheel. I machined it down, added this, uh, added this uh, handle there, and then made it couple correctly with the, uh, oh, oh. there we go. Made it couple correctly with the quill feed. And I really, come on, come on, suck it in. Sometimes, it's, anyway, oh, there we go. So this is how you lower the quill and this is how you raise the quill. It also has an integrated Z axis on my DRO. So I have X, Y, and Z. Um, so going up and down like this is now integral to my digital readout, which is fabulous. This is all the same things my old digital readout do, did. In fact, it's the exact same company, Newall, N-E-W-A-L-L. -L. They are the really nice, um, gauges and I specifically went with these because I work wet. I use a lot of cooling fluid and I didn't want glass. I don't need to educate you in the, all the vagaries of digital readout systems, but some of the systems are waterproof, some of them less so. I got the fully waterproof system because I'm a messy guy. Um, it does all the same thing normal milling machines do. Uh, you can bring the quill way down. You can, the same attachments you can put on the quill of a bridge port, you can put on this one. Uh, it has quill stop set. Uh, I have, oh yeah. So, um, one of the biggest pains of the ass of a, of a mill is the Z axis, is raising the Z axis. So when you wanna do this, you gotta do this. This doesn't sound like a lot, but it's only a hundred thou per turn. So 10 turns per inch. You gotta move this thing around a lot. You get kind of, uh, you get tired. I know it sounds like I'm complaining, but I'll, I promise you, every machinist you know, when you talk about having a motor on the knee, that is machinist luxury. A motor on the knee is, that is some, that is sleeping the sleep of the just man. You are just like, a motor on the knee is, is, a, is a delightful luxury. I also got a automatic uh, whey oil feeder down here. This automatically injects oil into the ways uh, about every three hours of machine use. Uh, so I don't just leave this on randomly. It will literally empty that tank in a few weeks if I did that. Um, I'm gonna turn this back off. And I set it up the way I set up all of my machine tools, kind of like what Tom Lipton described as like setting it up like a fighter pilot, right? The cockpit. I've got my, I've got my Bondhus, my Bondhus Allens here. I've got my hardened drill bits, my parallels. Uh, this light, it came with this light is really, really lovely. I'm still using this antique light for the other side. There is even a coolant reciprocating system here. Can you see that? Yeah, there's a coolant reciprocating system and I haven't gotten around to connecting it up. It uses the same coolant as my lathe. Again, just moving slowly. Yeah, there are a lot of small, like I, I know that a few of you have asked for a kind of a tour of how a mill works. Um, and I, I don't know how to give that tour. I mean, it's effectively a drill press in which you can lock every access you would need to and you can move things precisely without incident on all three of the axes um, in tiny increments if you need to. And that's the way I think of a milling machine. Um, having had so much experience on old worn out milling machines, it is among the deeper pleasures of my maker existence to be able to play on this thing because 
there are all these compromises you end up having to make with an older milling machine. You 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 got to go slower. You got to take passes and cut off less material. Vibration can be your real enemy. And with a brand new, like well tuned machine like this, so much of that is just not stuff you have to worry about. It's like it must be like this. The difference between taking apart like a uh, you know some cheap uh, you know. Eastern European car from the 70s versus a Mercedes engine. It's like the part fitment is just fundamentally different. And this brand new machine, like the way it operates feels fundamentally different, even though it's the same, just with less vibration and less, uh, less unexpected stuff. It's, I'm super happy to have it. And I kind of beam every time I get to use it. Um, you've been seeing it in the videos. Thank you so much for asking for the show and tell. Uh, I just haven't gotten around to it, but there she is, my new milling machine. Thank you guys for joining me for this, uh, one of the longest show and tells I've done. I don't think of this as a tool tip because like, there's going to be a run on new milling machines soon. Uh, show and tell, thank you for joining me and I will see you guys next time. Cheers. Thank you guys for watching that video. If you'd like to further support us at Tested, you can do so by buying some merch from us in our store. A link is below, but I wanted to tell you that for the first time, we are releasing a discounted bundle of Tested merch, specifically our original five demerit badges. These are ways in which every maker screws up. So we've got the measure once, curse twice, uh, releasing the mysterious blue smoke from electronics and stopping them from working breaking a drill bit, uh, 3D printer going all flying spaghetti monster on you, and my personal most common one, cutting your finger. <laughs> yeah. Get yourself over to tested-store.com and uh, line yourself up with some demerit badges. I'm going to sew these to my apron. Oh, that actually would make a good one-day build.